Uh, welcome and thank you for joining the New America uh, Fellows Program discussion of Abram Lusgarden's great new book, On the Move, uh, The Overheating Earth and the Uprooting of America. I'm Jeff Goodell, 2016 National Fellow. Um, before we start, a few things that are important to keep in mind. Um, if you have questions, please submit them to uh, the Q&A function and we will address them in the second half of uh, this conversation. We're eager to hear what you have to say, and I will do my best to include as many um, of your comments and questions as we can. And very importantly, um, copies are on the move are available for ordering uh, through the, our book selling partner, Solid State Books. You can find the link on this page. Buy the book. It's a great book. It's important um, to read and to uh, support uh, Abram's work. Um, Abram Lusgarden, a 20 22 Emerson Fellow at New America is an investigative reporter writing about climate change at ProPublica and for the New York Times. His writing also appears in The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Scientific American. His series on drought in the American West was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and his investigation into the oil company was the subject of the Emmy-nominated frontline documentary, The Spill. His other books include A Run to Failure, BP, and The Making of the Deepwater Horizon Disaster, and China's Great Train, Beijing's Drive West, and the Campaign to Remake Tibet. He lives, as we will discuss here, in the San Francisco Bay Area, where, by chance, I also grew up, so we have that in common. Uh, hey, Abram, how are you? Abram, how are you? Hey, Jeff, good. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Uh, congrats on the book, on all the great um, reviews it's gotten. It, I know that... Um, these few first weeks after a book comes out are kind of nerve wracking, crazy time. <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, doing great. Um, there's a lot going on, but it's been uh, overwhelmingly positive and it's exciting, as I know you know, just coming out of, of your own tunnel of, of uh, pushing your great new book, too. Um, so but it's uh, no complaints. It's going great. Great. So I love this book and I really um have a lot of respect for what you have pulled off here um because i think one of the most interesting things that you did in the big picture is you took a question that everybody who thinks about climate change even people who don't think about climate change asks which is where should i live should i move where should i move the kind of question that is you know basically every uber driver that i that i mention um that i write about climate change asks me and you took it and it kind of blew that up and explored it in all its complexity and, and showed that, as with everything in climate, there's no simple answer to these complex questions. And the book really explores um, the sort of dynamic of that, the economics, the, um, as you mentioned, the spiritual aspects of it, the difficult emotional aspects of it. And so I, I think that's, I, I really... Um, I think that that sort of framing that you've given to this simple question is is really terrific and is as at the heart of um, the book's appeal. I want to ask you, since I'm presuming that a lot of the people who are listening to this are writers and thinking about their own books and how to write books, I want to ask you about your choice about how you framed this book. Um, you know, you the op the book opens essentially with a conversation uh, with a woman named. Um, uh, Ellen Herdell, if I'm pronouncing it right, um, and her decision, yeah, right. and her decision whether who, who who's a neighbor of yours or lives in Northern California with you, and her kind of anguish about uh, in the aftermath of the wildfires there and things, and her anguish about whether to stay or go, um, and you, your conversations with her, and I'm just interested strategically as a book writer how you thought about that and why you use that as the framing for this big story. Yeah, uh, thank you for um, that intro and, and your thoughts on the book. I appreciate that. Um, uh, choosing that opening anecdote uh, and Ellen was it was a um, it was a kind of a complex process. I and mean, um, the thing about Ellen's story is that it's very very close to my own experience. And uh, when I wrote a magazine article that kind of introduced this subject matter, I did write about my own experience, uh, but I didn't want to write a memoir for the for the book. Um, and what I appreciated about Ellen's experience is uh, 
the uncertainty of it all. I, I think it would be easy to go and find, um, and I spoke with lots of people who had really dramatic examples of, uh, you know, of fleeing a disaster, the certainty of their move, uh, the, the, their arrival in wherever they went. Um, and I think, you know, we would expect that story and we, maybe we've heard it before. Um, but the, the thing that I really appreciated about Ellen's experience is, um, that it was it was just a process and there was no end in sight to that process and that's kind of how i feel personally and that's where i think you know a lot of people are as they try to figure out how this changing world is affecting you know their individual lives um so for her there is no doubt that the constant sort of drumbeat of terrible experiences related to wildfires um was changing their lives but she hadn't figured out what to do about it um and she wasn't sure that she you know, you know, would move. Uh, and by the end of the book, she hasn't moved uh, and neither have I. Um, and uh, I just, I really like the sort of uh, uh, nuance and, and uncertainty of, of her story. Yeah, me too. Uh, you know, one of the challenges of writing about climate change that you wrestle with in this book and that I've wrestled with in my books, and I think anybody who writes about climate change, um, has to wrestle with is the sort of um, you know you just described a, a very personal narrative, uh, a story about a a, a, a woman um, wrestling with this decision and all its complexity, and yet to talk about you know your book is full as is my books and and anybody who writes seriously about climate change with sort of data and numbers and studies and models and what will happen and what is happening and the future changes that are coming. I'm interested in. Uh, having you articulate how you think about that, um, because you know one of my <coughs> theses is, is that you know data and numbers turn people off from the emotional engagement that is required for you know serious attention to a book, right? You, that that you know charts only go so far, numbers only go so far, and it's really difficult in our business and of writing climate books to wrestle with that. And you do a really great job of it, but I, I'm interested in how you think about that tactically as a writer. I, um, you're right. It's an incredible challenge. Uh, and I've never uh, dealt with a project that was so sort of chock full of, uh, you know, of data and statistics and um, figures, uh, all of which I personally found fascinating and, and hope that people who read the book do. But, um, you know, th it, it was an overwhelming amount of information for this project. Um, one of the things that I think helped me from the very start is I, you know, I went out and I did a lot of this reporting and a lot of thinking about, you know, what climate migration means for people from a human side first. I, I happened to do that mostly in Central America, not in the United States at first, but I was really deeply engaged in the question of, you know, how does somebody make that decision? What's the sort of tipping point in a psychological way? Um, so it was more focused on the human experience. And this is just a reporting process thing, but the numbers came, you know, came to me later. Um, I used a lot of modeling, collected a lot of data from the research firm Rhodium Group and, and others. Um, but by the time I was receiving them, they were kind of informing impressions that I already had as opposed to giving me those impressions. So I think um, if that makes any sense. So by the time it came to kind of put this together into telling a story, that's the order in which, you know, I was able to tell the story too. And I think that helps the statistics find some relevance as, you know, as opposed to just sort of, you know, throwing out an enormous amount of material and hoping that their importance is self-evident, um, you know, that, that by interweaving them, you know, in individual, you know, experiences and, and emotional experiences that aren't just data driven, um, they they provide context instead of sort of being the main story. Yeah, and, and interesting. I, and another strategic decision you made, um, which I'm interested in your reflecting on, is it the the book? You know, is informed by some of your reporting in Central America. You, there's you know lots of references to the, kind of this as a global phenomenon, but you really focus on America, on the United States. You know, I could easily have seen another path for this book that looked at it in a more global, you know, perspective. And I understand the daunting challenge of that and all of that. But I'm interested in in how you thought about that, about I'm going to I'm going to tell a story really of America and not of this sort of global transformation. 
Now I'm going to say the opposite of what I just said, which is that I, I the data was <laughs> the data was so fascinating to me that it sort of begged for for that story. Um, I wanted to do both of those stories, uh, but um, but I, I became really really um, intrigued by um, you know what some of the information I'd collected said about the United States and how specific and granular uh, it was. And, and I just felt like that presented a million opportunities to dive into specific counties, um, whether in Texas or Louisiana or, uh, you know, or Sonoma, California, um, and, and begin to kind of parse out, you know, what was happening in those places. And I feel like that's um, a missing piece of, you know, climate journalism so far that we're moving in that direction. But We've gone from, you know, sort of collectively very broad discussions of global trends, continental trends, maybe country trends, um, and and that it hasn't gotten very, very specific. And um, I don't think a lot of Americans think about how, you know, climate change is affecting their lives other than expressing, you know, experiencing the heat um, in particular or disasters when they happen. Uh, and so this is sort of a convergence of, of opportunity. Um, I loved, uh, you know, how specific the data was, and I just thought it was a novel way to, you know, to have a conversation that would um, shift that conversation a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, I think it's great. Um, one of my favorite chapters in the book is, uh, I think it's chapter three, um, the Great American Climate Scam, uh, which, which I think really does a, a, a great job of articulating the forces that are keeping people in place. Um, rather than moving uh, the subsidies, uh, the insurance issues, things like that. Talk a, a little bit about that, about about what what is this great American climate scam that you describe in that chapter? Yeah, the great American climate scam is, you know, is our system of uh, policy supports, uh, which is largely um, the way the book considers it insurance. Um, that has incentivized us to kind of live in places with uh, with the highest risk, um, and it's not the only reason that people live in places like the coast of Florida or in you know in Arizona, um, but it's made the costs of living in those places and the consequences of living uh, in those places from a climate perspective um, cheaper or uh, seem you know diminished. So. You know, the chapter tells the story of uh, Hurricane Andrew uh, in Florida, which just devastated Florida and really put like a, a threatened an immediate stop to Florida's economic growth and development uh, and and probably, you know, would have in natural circumstances presaged a, a real like out migration from the state of Florida. And um, the state looked at that disaster and the costs of it and said, we can't we can't afford to have, uh, you know, people leave this state. Uh, it'll change the trajectory of our economy forever. And the insurers uh, looked at the state of Florida and Hurricane Andrew and said, we can't in a capitalist system afford to insure people here. So we're not going to offer insurance anymore. Um, and the state solved that problem by subsidizing insurance by creating a state run plan that made insurance available for any homeowner who still wanted to move there and and then made it cheap and and actually discounted at 20 percent below market rates as a way to incentivize and attract people um, you know to continue to move there and states have replicated a system like that california is using it now to uh you know to encourage people to or to protect people who live in wildfire zones but also to encourage people you know to continue to to move and build um, in those regions and so I looked at that as, you know, as a way uh, of um, of mutating uh, sort of the natural signal around, you know, climate risk, um, the signals that would tell each of us that we're in a dangerous place or that we're in a place that is dangerous to our financial assets or our, you know, our savings. Um, uh, and, th and that's what those subsidies do, whether they're water subsidies, you know, in the Western United States or uh, federal subsidies for flood insurance or, you know, or FEMA backstops after disasters or, you know, these state run insurance plans that are in 30 states now. Um, uh, they, you know, they mute and distort the, the signals of risk. And I think they've had the effect of, of um, you know, muting uh, public outcry over the severity of the changes in the climate that they're living in. Yeah, so I, I totally agree. You know, I, I wrote a book in 2017 about sea level rise called The Water Will Come. It was focused on Miami and in, in Florida. And, you know, I'm often, you know, people often point out to me, well, that was almost 10 years ago. Miami's still standing, it's still booming, you know. 
And I talk about some of these things that you're mentioning with subsidies and insurance and, and people just say, ha, you know, no, that's, they're just going to continue doing this. And no politician wants to really, you know, break the news that we have to change these um, subsidies. We have to reform flood insurance and things. How do you, you talk in the book a little bit about how this will play out in places like that. You know, the, the, you talk about the wildfires in paradise and the dislocation from these sort of natural disasters. But this, how do you see, can you articulate for us briefly how you see this political forces that you just described in the climate scam and these subsidies? How do you see this playing out? You know, uh, an overall premise of the book is not just that people are going to move eventually as their climate changes, but um, that that decision to move will ultimately be an economic one, not not just an environmentally driven one. Um, <clears throat> so the climate pressures will change our economic circumstances, our economic safety. And um, that's what I think will be sort of the realization moment, you know, for a lot of Americans who do move is that they have a stake, uh, a financial stake in, in, you know, in making that change. And um, the way that the subsidies, you know, are ending or the way that policymakers begin to confront these, you know, these threats, uh, you know, is a part of that shift. And it's really hard to predict, you know, where it goes and how quickly that shift happens. Um, and it might take a while. I mean, we might continue to see, um, ongoing subsidies and ongoing growth in places like Phoenix, Arizona for many years to come mm -hmm. before it does change. Um, but I think the, you know, the insurance market, for example, um, you know, is going to continue, is continuing to pull out of, of the highest risk places. And those subsidized markets are um, facing real headwinds. I mean, they're, uh, you know, the book describes in, you know, in great detail, um, they are not profit making machines. They're losing a great amount of money. And as they lose money, they're putting, you know, those very state governments in jeopardy and they're, you know, uh, uh, putting potential costs and assessments on, you know, on policymakers. So the financial risk is increasing. The environmental risk, the physical dangers of of living in wildfire, you know, urban interface zones are increasing, um, and local governments have counter incentive. I mean, they don't want to lose population, they don't want to lose growth, and they don't want to lose the representation that comes with with that population. Um, but inevitably, there you know there is going to be uh, a sort of a tipping point. I'm seeing that in Northern California now. There's a robust conversation among home, homeowners who are being routinely notified that they're losing their wildfire insurance, you know, about um, what to do about it. And it's just, you know, it's a household dinner table type conversation that is a very like imperceptible shift, but it's the beginning of, of an economic shift that I think is going to, you know, snowball into something um, sizable. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I, I'm talking to you from Austin, Texas, where I moved from upstate New York, and we can talk about that a little bit. <clears throat> complexities of moving. I, I feel like I kind of moved into the belly of the beast here. Um, uh, but you talk about it in your book also, you know, the, the and, I, and so I see here in, in, in Texas, I go online and I see real estate ads for this low lying, you know, co coastal developments that are cheap. And, you know, I look, you take one look at them and you know, they're doomed. I mean, they're completely like right on the water in this, on these sort of low lying bodies, but they're really cheap and they're marketing them as inexpensive housing. And, and you talk about in your book, you talk about the Louisiana coast and the obvious pressures of people uh, living there with flooding and subsidence and everything. But you also point out that a place like Slidell is growing in population, right? So there's this really interesting push me pull you, even with the economic forces. I mean, this is the complexity of of climate migration: is that um, you know there's no there's no single pathway, there's no single tipping point, there's no single influence. Even um, you know, climate migrants aren't only moving because of climate pressures; they have all these you know, other interests, from love to opportunities to economic forces, etc. And, uh, you know, and yes, yeah, some places can be uh, seem like a disaster for the people that are living there. Uh, and at the same time that they seem like opportunity or relative opportunity to someone else. And I think it's that relativity, you know, that's, that's really interesting. And um, Slidell, Louisiana is not the southernmost place on, uh, you know, on the continent. Um, and, uh, you know, I chose it because, um, 
I wrote a lot about in the book, this, you know, this uh, wonderful woman, Colette Pichon Battle, who, you know, is central to this conversation. Uh, and also because I think her experience is, is really fascinating. Her, you know, her family um, is, is forced to leave Slidell, uh, you know, after Hurricane Katrina, and she chooses to come back and, and get engaged in this question of, of climate migration. Um, but the fact is that, you know, Hurricane Katrina and its aftermath affected uh, the poorest people in Slidell the most, and they had a difficult time recovering, and many of them were forced to leave. Um, but uh, Slidell, as you just mentioned, you know, is north of, of New Orleans and north of all these parishes that are flooding faster. Um, and a lot of those people can afford, you know, to, to move, uh, to, to rebuild in a place like Slidell or to gentrify in a place like like Slidell. And so, um, so it has seen this sort of this like pulsing flux of, of growth and decline or change in its demographics, um, change, you know, in, in its wealth um, as, as people move. Uh, and a lot of those movements are, you know, are going to be um, short distance moves. Um, so we're not, you know, we're, we're talking more about people moving from like New Orleans across, um, you know, Lake Pontchartrain to, to Slidell than we are about people moving from New Orleans to Michigan. Um, and, and that's what, you know, gives you that, that kind of, uh, you know, rapid expansion and contraction. Right, right, right. One other, one other aspect of the complexity of this that I really appreciated you highlighting in your book and that, um, I talked a little bit about in, in, in my book, um, about heat, um, is this kind of American idea and faith in technology and ingenuity to save us. You know, there's this, I mean, I get this all the time when I talk about, you know, I live in Austin here. I get at a dinner table conversations in the middle of summer and things people just, you know, talking about whether to leave or not. But this question like, well, it's hot. Yeah, but we have air conditioning, you know, and like people will say to me when I give talks about my book or something like, well, we just need to get more air conditioning to people. And he's not a big deal. Why are you so freaked out about it? just buy, get people more air conditioners? And you talk about that in, in the book also about just this sort of broad faith that these changes kind of don't really matter unless the water is like coming into your front door or something that that will figure this out and that, that that will come up with a fix for it talk about about that as one of the sort of dynamics in this change you're talking about yeah um you know and i love the way that you do that in uh in the heat will kill you first which i i just recently finished by the way so um just like excellent um you know to, to sort of state the obvious, I mean, I think we have a whole culture in the United States that for, you know, for 150 years or more has, you know, um, thought that we could out engineer nature, and we've done a pretty good job of it for the most part. Um, and, you know, I think what we're approaching now is um, a point where maybe we can continue to out engineer nature in certain ways, but, um, but there will be ways that we cannot, uh, you know, engineer nature that make it, you um, unpleasant to to live in and you know and that's going to change the equation a little bit i mean we may be able to if we have limitless amounts of energy and uh and limitless wealth to purchase that energy which are two separate problems we might be able to continue to cool our homes forever in phoenix or in in austin um but we might get really tired of being stuck inside our cool homes <laughs> and not not being able to go outside and you know and look at one of the things that that I modeled for this book is wet bulb temperatures and how they they kind of spread up the the mississippi river basin and um you know when you start to think about impacts of heat and humidity especially that um change whether your kids can play sports uh what seasons they can play sports in or if they need to you know not have outdoor playtime at school or if outdoor laborers can't you know can't work outside i mean i think those are the things that start to change what you know our imaginations hope will happen in terms of of technology um i also i think we will continue to improve technology and we will have technological advances that you know that mitigate some of some of these shifts but uh, you know, on balance, uh, you know, the natural world, um, the the scope and force of of those shifts, I you know, I just think are going to continue to um, outpace anything we can do to to um, to blunt them. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. I mean, here in 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 Texas, you know, the conversations I've had, many of the people who are most serious uh, about kind of getting out of here, and who were most kind of spooked by the extreme heat wave we had last summer here were moms of kids who play football and you know they don't want their 
they want their kid to play football. Football matters a lot here in Texas, but they don't want their child to die out on the field uh, during the summer practice. And so I was like, maybe we should move somewhere else. And so it is interesting these, um, you know, what these inflection points are and what these drivers are. Um, and another thing that, that you get to in your book that I think is really fascinating and not talked about enough is the, um, I think you use the word sort of spiritual aspect, but it's, it's, it's the attachment we feel to a place. I mean, it's, it's, it's meaningful where you grew up. It's meaningful, um, you know, how you feel when you walk outside and the kinds of trees there are, and whether it's a mountain or a beach or whatever. I mean, we have emotional attachments to places. And, and not only that, it's like today for, is a great example. I'm in Austin, Texas. We had 40 days over 105 degrees last summer. I lived a vampire life, couldn't go outside, you know, uh, except in the early mornings. Um, and yet today it's like, 77 degrees the blue bonnets are out it's like a perfect day it's like why would i ever want to leave here you know and so the this sort of psych psychological aspects of this um are i think are really interesting um and you talk about that in your book and you talk about that yourself um about whether to stay or go tell me about about that and about how you how how we're thinking about this book changed how you think about your own life this is the aspect of this entire project in this book you know that i've thought about the most it's it's the beginning and the end point you know of my personal experience um and it's and it's very personal and i um and i wanted to acknowledge that in the book in a way that lets everybody else who's having a similar experience kind of you know um find some common cause and in, in you know the, there is no right or wrong answer the data can't tell you what to do with your life this is a you know this is a personal decision and there's lots of other factors like um your connection to land and place and for me um i love the outdoors you know i i love beautiful places and that's been the driving um uh, you know, decisive factor in my life about where I where I choose to live. It's really been about, you know, where, not what opportunities or what family I was in proximity to or what city it was, but, um, you know, what my natural environment uh, was around me. And I always had this, you know, this ideal, uh, you know, through my youth that, um, that I could always make that decision. And I keep a list of, you know, these wonderful places that I hope to, you know, spend more time in. And there's Northern California, and there's you know, the Rocky Mountains and there's upstate New York and all these beautiful places. Um, and so I think, you know, the the 40,000 foot view realization and the difficult, you know, thing for me in thinking about, you know, what is climate change and, you know, what is climate migration? How does it affect that is that it, it takes away some of that freedom, um, that it changes the equation, uh, that in the future, you know, and maybe we're in a interstitial, you know, stage right now where I don't have to move yet. But I think, you know, I think that that's going to shift. And, um, and so ultimately, we're losing that luxury of, of choice that, you know, it's becoming naive for me or someone like me to think, you know, I could just choose to live in the most beautiful place I want to, because um, many of those beautiful places are um, turning out to be, you know, dangerous or unsustainable places. Uh, and that's been, you know, <clears throat> that's a difficult realization. Um, and at the same time, throughout the process of writing this book, I, uh, you know, I found my stress relief um, hitting the trails or going into the woods in that very place that I valued. And, uh, you know, I had a thousand internal dialogues about answering this question, um, you know, and, and showing how beautiful the trail was that I was on as if that would just sort of explain why I have not yet, you know, moved from Northern California, which I portray as being in this very, you know, um, uh, uh, tense and, um, you know, and risky place to live. Um, so it's this, it's this constant push and pull. Um, and, you know, I think it's very much, uh, just determined in the moment by what's happening. I, you know, your, your 40 plus days of extreme heat sound like, um, a moment to me, if I had that experience for me, it was, you know, 2020 was a terrible fire season, but California hasn't had a lot of terrible fire seasons the last, you know, three years. Um, we've been lucky. So it makes it easy to sort of be more complacent again, or or revert to you know to the beauty of place. But I know that that'll that'll change too. 
Um, and so the book kind of explores that. And, um, and like I said, you know, it tries to, to, you know, give permission, uh, for everybody else to kind of explore that too, and not, not feel like they're just being sort of compelled in a direction or that, you know, they have to, uh, choose what somebody else to, determines is the right answer for them. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to encourage everyone who's, um, watching and listening to this to, um, type in some questions. Um, uh, I'd be happy <clears throat> to, um, to ask them and to um, uh, talk about whatever is on people's minds. I, I'm looking at the list of questions here. There, there's one interesting practical question that I'd like to ask you, which is um, one of the viewers here says, thus far, while climate might be a consideration for people moving, it's not the primary factor, which is obviously true. Um, so how do we encourage people to move? How, and I think that's an interesting question, like practically, like, is it about reforming in these incentives and these subsidies that we talked about? I mean, what, I guess it's another way of asking what does managed re kind of retreat look like? Um, I'm going to break that down a little bit uh, because I think managed retreat is sort of an exception, uh, you know, or an extreme uh, end of, of a broader trend that'll ultimately involve a lot more people. And so my first thought, my first answer as you're, you're speaking is that I don't think that we need to encourage people to move, um, you know, or that, or that the country needs to have a particular agenda in terms of, you know, in terms of this larger question of climate migration. I think that we need to, uh, the collective we, um, you know, facilitate the choices that people make and anticipate that people will will be moving, um, that some will be moving and some won't be moving. And in the places that, that people don't move, there'll be a contraction of communities and that's a whole other sort of policy set of challenges. Um, then there are places that, that, you know, will require some, some managed retreat. And those are places um, primarily along the coast, which are, you know, going to be increasingly flooded and will require incredible amounts of money to defend or protect against with, you know, dumps of sand on beaches or seawalls. Um, and many, many places will not be able to make that investment. And so what we're starting to see now uh, along the southeastern seaboard and in places or Louisiana coast is this, you know, managed retreat. And that's, um, you know, a coordinated effort sponsored by or facilitated by government in many cases that, you know, that helps people relocate. Um, I think that's sort of a niche part of, of uh, you know, of the conversation. Um, but mostly, I think that, that, you know, what we're talking about is the need to prepare for uh, demographic change, and that that means, um, uh, you know, providing a lot of the services and infrastructure and investments that we've needed to, you know, socially for, you um, for a long time without the influence of climate change, um, but considering it will amplify the need for, for those same um, investments. Yeah. I mean, one of the things connected with this that you write about in your book a little bit, um, you know, that is actually kind of rare in a book about climate change. It's not, that's not about sort of, you know, energy innovation that is actually about the, the, the impacts of climate change is that, you know, there's an opportunity to make money here, right? There's speculators, right? Who think, okay, well, as you point out, you know, what I think you, 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 you talk about um, uh, a new, hotter, smaller, more northerly America will be vastly different than what exists today, which I think is a very provocative and true statement. And it's also a statement that if you take seriously and you are an investor, you know, it, you could think about how this um you could benefit from this and how you could make money do you do you feel like the given your immersion into this and things do you feel like this sort of speculative aspect of this of of kind of essentially betting on these changes uh, as a as an engine of you know making money is going to be a powerful force in this transition you're talking about um, the, I think the answer, uh, depends on, on the speed at which the change happens. And from an investment standpoint, that's really hard to time, right? Because what I might be looking at a trend, uh, that takes two decades, you know, to, to manifest and an investor might be looking for, um, 
might be impatient about waiting two decades for, for a return on their investment. So there's a difference in timing. But, um, but I mean, I can tell you for sure, and it, no great surprise that, um, you know, speculators are already considering this as, as an opportunity um, on both ends of the spectrum, uh, you know, effectively shorting investments in dangerous places and, you know, and going long and, you know, investments in, in prospective growth places. And the only question is timing, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I, but I have a lot of conversations with, for example, uh, you know, folks in the real estate industry um, or uh, in the hotel industry, uh, you know, who are trying to determine, you know, like, how long should you hold those properties, um, you know, in Key West and uh, and when's the right time to invest in those, you know, those new ones in Detroit um, and those kinds of conversations, you know, or uh, you look at like what's happened with land farmland prices in the upper Midwest and, and the Great Lakes region, um, you know, is another sort of subtle signal. Uh, I don't think climate change is the only factor in any of those decisions, just as, you know, questioner pointed out it's not the only factor in migration um but it's 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 there uh it is a detectable signal and um you know and i think it's going to increasingly be one um and we until you know until this country turns away from you know a capitalistic system uh anytime mm -hmm. there is growth it's going to correspond to uh you know to um economic opportunity in the places where there is growth and uh you know there's two ends of the migration spectrum there's always going to be contraction on one end um and growth and expansion on on the other yeah yeah that's a great point um and I, here's a question from um one of the viewers here um that kind of connects with this and that I feel playing out here in Austin too, which is, um, you know, as most people know, one of the fastest growing cities in America. It's just crazy, you know. I mean, things are, you know, uh, buildings going on everywhere here. Traffic is insane. Restaurants are impossible to get into. You know, all all that kind of stuff. Um, and the question is, how do you see climate change interacting with the housing crisis in the U.S., which is, I think, a really interesting intersection of two very powerful and urgent forces, both economically and politically? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, in destination zones in particular, um, uh, there's a strong correlation with housing need. Uh, you know, growth will require more housing. Um and uh, it's it will like climate change will exacerbate you know anything uh, from your your list of issues. Uh, it will you know if not carefully attended to exacerbate um, you know housing shortage where there is a shortage and um, give good cause to you know to racing forward mm -hmm. with you know um, uh, efforts to expand that housing. And I think not only to expand like the quantity of that housing but the quality of it. So you know you start to think about. Um, what buildings are constructed with and, and how efficient they are and what kind of insulation, you know, they use and what kind of cooling is, is needed or is available, um, you know, and the, and the proximity of that housing to, you know, to good grocery stores and food supply and transit. And those are all, um, you know, becoming more urgent questions in the places that, um, you know, are, are growing quickly and, and probably will continue to grow, uh, you know, as, as climate shifts. Uh, where people live. Mm -hmm. um, here's a related question that I want to just frame by saying that, you know, you write very powerfully and evocatively um, about um, some time you, some reporting you did in, in Central America and in Guatemala and the forces that are pushing people out of places like that and into America, into the U.S., um, obviously an issue that is front and center in American politics right now. It's like, you know, again, sitting here in Austin, it's all anyone talks about is the border, the border, the border. Um, um, and the question uh, from one of our um, participants here is, how do the safer places projected to receive climate migrants prepare for these inflows? What should places be, you know, be doing to to prepare for these di these dynamic um, uh, population changes that you're talking about in this book, um, I mean, on a on a local, literal level, we're talking about you know how to how to receiving cities prepare for a larger growing population. Um, you know, they need to have adequate housing and education and employment opportunities and support systems for. Uh, 
for a larger number of people to keep them engaged in their economy and contributing to their economy, or the risk is you end up with, um, you know, sort of the slumification of, uh, you know, of large urban areas. And that can happen in the United States, um, you know, and happens in places, you know, like Atlanta. Um, and that's what you see in large growing destination cities, uh, you know, elsewhere in the world in Guatemala city, for example. Um, but if you're asking from a geopolitical you know, standpoint, how to, how to receiving nations like the United States prepare, um, it's a, it's a fraught question and, um, and it's going to be, you know, a larger and larger question. Um, you know, I think that there's real value in investing, uh, through foreign aid in, uh, helping communities, affected by climate change, drought in Guatemala, for example, um, uh, through investments in agriculture and water supplies and water storage and things that um, can reduce the flow of migration. Um, because I, you know, learned in my reporting, you know, abroad is um, that uh, when it comes to climate migration, anyway, you know, none of the people that I talked to um, wanted to, to leave their homes. They were really you know, looking for for um, any possible way, uh, you know, to to remain where they are, and so, um, you know, if you seize on on that desire, there's opportunity to help people remain where they are. Um, and then what happens, you know, with the with the rest is a, is a difficult. I I don't know how to forecast, you know, politically what happens with the American border. Only to say that I think you know the pressure will increase, and we're entering an era of um, you know of permanent mass migration globally and and permanent pressure on the US border and um, uh, answers, are, you know, good answers are difficult to come by, but it, but it raises, you know, real questions about, you know, loss and damages and who's responsible, you know, to whom around the world and, and how we, uh, you know, as citizens of, you know, of the United States or of country A, you know, feel a responsibility or choose not to take responsibility, you know, for what happens to, you know, citizens in, in country B. Um, we're gonna be talking a lot about that. In the I agree. Right. And that's, you know, the heart of the whole thing with the Green Climate Fund and, you know, how much the U.S. is not uh, participating in that. You know, I mean, we can't even get funds for Ukraine, much less for, you know, adaptation in, you know, Guatemala. So it's a very, yeah, at our um, uh, political moment in America right now, a very, very difficult question. Um, to shift to another a uh, question from one of our participants here, um, is it, he, he or she writes, one thing you write about is that once the real estate insurance risk equation tips, it may be too late as no financing will be available. When will that happen in Florida? <laughs> uh, well, if I could tell you exactly when, uh, <laughs> uh, or if anybody could, then um, those speculators would be, you know, would be out there uh, doing, uh, acting on, you know, on that information. Um, I, I, I don't know. Is you know, it, that's the dynamic that um, the economists and experts that I talk to describe to me. But the timing, you know, is really unknown. But the, you know, the um, the pattern is that. You know, if you if you have growing risk and that risk isn't backstopped by an insurer that doesn't want to, you know, protect a property, then banks, um, you know, will cease loaning on on those properties, um, which will grind the real estate market, you know, theoretically to a halt. Um, because unless you're buying with cash and you're, you know, affluent enough to, you know, to maintain a property as a as a trophy property or um, to own it independent of financing. Um, you won't be able to buy or sell uh, if if the banks stop engaging uh, in you know in properties that um, that they think are too risky to to get paid back on on their investments. And do you see? I mean, I mean, um, it, you know, it is hard to see how you have thirty year mortgages if you don't have home insurance, right? I mean, but um, do you see any any way around that? I mean, it, I mean, it seems to me that the way the insurance is going, that's there there isn't going to be, except at very maybe extreme prices, thirty year mortgages for for, for all intents and purposes, ins insurance available for these thirty year mortgages. So so I mean, what are the possible scenarios here? I think it's going to be, you know, a little bit of a push and pull for for a while, uh, and that's partially a negotiation between industry, and it's partially just sort of, you know, um, you know, our cultural reaction to to the changes. Um, you know, my book really comes down hard on 
subsidized insurance uh, for the ways that it, I think it's blinded people to, to risk. But um, that subsidized insurance also plays plays a role here, and it's an important role, and it protects a lot of people, uh, you know, who um, maybe have lived where they live for a very long time and need to remain there and need some economic stability. And so, um, so I think that that will continue to play an important role. I don't think my personal opinion that that those programs should continue to expand in a in a in a way that sort of blindly encourages growth, but that they can serve a role in stabilizing communities that are affected now and sort of easing this transition. I think what's happening with California uh, in in its insurance market and you know with wildfire risk in particular is kind of telling of of where we're headed. Um, and that dynamic is basically that you know insurers are threatening to leave the state because the state insurance commission won't allow them to raise prices, but those insurers would be willing to insure properties if they were allowed to charge high enough rates that they feel like are commensurate with the climate risk. Um, And so they will ultimately be allowed to raise rates. And so the cost of insurance will go up a lot before it disappears that I, you know, I think that insurers who are withdrawing insurance now might offer it again when they're allowed to raise costs. And then there's, um, you know, a lot of progress towards uh, intermediate steps that can mitigate. So, so that providing insurance isn't a black or white decision for an insurer or for a homeowner um, that your rates uh, or your ability to get insurance are improved if you, take mitigation, you know, measures to cut down trees and shrubs around your home that reduce wildfire risk, for example, or you put a fireproof roof on your on your house, then you can get insurance. And so there'll be a similar sort of tug uh, and, you know, push and push and pull, you know, in coastal regions and other threatened places, you know, around the country. Um, And there will also be places like so much of of Florida, uh, which can't build seawalls and really can't protect, uh, you know, an enormous amount of of its land, which is ultimately going to flood, um, that won't be able to play that game for for much longer, that will be forced to, you know, by circumstances to just retreat. Yeah. One of the interesting things that's happening, too, in the insurance stuff that's happening literally to my wife and I here in Austin is, um, you know, we have some we have a small house with big trees uh, and the insurance company wants us to get rid of the trees because of the risk, right, of of damage to the house. And we're like, no, these trees are fabulous. They keep the house cool. You know, there's ob- obviously many reasons one wants to have trees, but rising insurance rates, they're pushing harder and harder for us to remove these things. So it's counterproductive from the kind of climate, you know, and, and personal sort of um, uh perspective but you know it's all about sort of reducing these risks and that but that is reshaping austin in a you know to into this sort of treeless world that is you know tragic uh, in my view and what i want to bring up one other point that connects with this that you talk about at the very end of your book that i think is very profound and you and you you hint at it um i don't mean to say you don't I don't mean hint as in a negative. I mean, you 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 suggest it um, at the end, and I think it's a very poignant way to end the book, which is you're having a conversation with Ellen, who who you opened the book with, um, who is deciding whether or not to stay or leave. And um, you're wrestling yourself with that. And and at the end, Ellen, I, you know, decides that she's going to stay, but in on different terms, right? That she's isn't she ends up renting, right? And her and her family ends up renting. But the idea that I wanted to just have you articulate is the way she suggests, and you suggest at the end of the book, that the whole idea of home is going is being transformed by this. That uh, I think she suggests, or you suggest in the end, about this sort of, almost sort of more nomadic idea that we're going to stay here for a while. But this idea that I'm building this house or living in this house and my grandchildren will live here. And this is, you know, this is my spot on earth and the spot of my family on earth. That's an old world idea that is not going to survive, uh, you know, in, in this new climate world we're, we're, we're plunging into. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Cause I think that's a really big idea. Yeah. You know, I think that what Ellen is describing in that case, um, you know, is, coming to terms slowly with uh, what it means to live in uncertainty. And, um, and that, that's our new world for all of us. Uh, you know, if there's, if there's any one thing in my view about, um, you know, the climate crisis and the era that we're moving into, it's that we can't really predict what 
will happen and we don't know exactly how it's going to change what we're used to in um uh in in all the ways in in home and economy and opportunity and family um and so you know part of you know we can have our stages of you know of denial uh you know and grief and acceptance as we sort of you know learn more about the implications of climate change for our lives and and i think that one of the things that we arrive at you know towards the end of of that process is um accepting uncertainty and that's what you know that's what ellen uh talks about and it's and it's similar to my own you know thought process about about where i live which is resigning to the idea that um might not have a perfect answer right now um and that there is no sort of finality in either a decision that somebody might make to move or a decision that somebody might make to stay um you know and she describes uh she's just really just musing at this point in our conversation uh you know and she describes the like the, maybe we just have a more nomadic lifestyle and i think what that means is you know maybe for people who can um and this is obviously you know a privileged op you know option for for some people but um you know, maybe you go and spend wildfire season on the East Coast and you come back to California in the wintertime when, you know, the hills are, are green and lush. And I think, you know, that's what that means for her. Um, or maybe we try and stay because we love it here. But uh, but economically, I'm going to divorce, you know, my financial security uh, uh, from this climate transition because I'm not going to invest in a, in, a, in a home and keep all of my, you know, my savings in real estate. I'm going to rent, um, for example. Um, and those are the kinds of like little subtle tweaks and, you know, and um, little things that that each of us can begin to do and are going to begin to do to kind of mitigate these circumstances. Um, uh, but it, it gets back to what I was saying, you know, earlier about my ideal of the freedom of choice to choose, you know, choose where I live. And, and for me, you know, that's what um, that's what home has always been about. It's it's a place that I come from and then it's a place that I choose. And um and in the future i think we're talking about uncertainty and and the reduction of choice you know um yeah. and that's what ellen's expressing yeah yeah um and and as you just pointed out in, in what you were in your response just now and also in your book um you know you point out that this is a those of us who are lucky enough to be able to make that decision right that have the financial well-being and, and you say in the book migration uh, is a measure of mobility. Mobility is a measure of wealth, right? And so, you know, um, that's a, that distinction between people who have the freedom to go live somewhere else during wildfire season versus those who don't is a very profound divide in, in this whole conversation, not just about migration, but about climate in general, right? Yeah, it's a it's a profound divide in terms of how people are affected, first of all, because I think, you know, the, um, uh, the poorest Americans, the poorest people in the, you know, in the world, um, and, and often ethnic minorities as well, you know, are, are disproportionately bearing, you know, the brunt of, of the change itself. Um, and then we'll have the least the least mobility. Um, what the data projects is the, you know, it'll be kind of an upper middle class segment of, of Americans that have the most flexibility. Um, to move, uh, that there'll be, you know, young families who have energy and opportunity to go and work in a new place, um, and the wealth to make that change, you know, who can do it, um, that, a, that a large part of the conversation needs to be about those that are sort of trapped or not mobile, and what happens to them and the places that, um, you know, might, might shrink, uh, or cease, you know, cease to grow um, as climate changes. And then you have the very, you know, the wealthiest of, of the wealthy, um, who are those who can continue to live on the coast of Florida without insurance or self-insure or keep a home, you know, keep a farm in Vermont, even as they continue to live in Los Angeles, um, you know, and, the, and that kind of opportunity. Right. Um, one of the things I like also about your book um, is that it skirts, uh, not, it doesn't skirt, it, 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 it doesn't even, um, it articulates in a different way this question that a lot of people have about like, are we doomed or are we not? You know, which is unfortunately the sort of binary that a lot of this climate conversation gets trapped into um, because you really do talk about, you know, mobility and the dynamics of that. Um, we have a question here um, that kind of connects with that from, from one of our participants here that is, you know, simply, you know, 
how do we maintain a positive outlook while acknowledging these climate risks and these challenges? I mean, how 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 do we think about this in a or how do you think about this in a way, you know, that that um, doesn't give in to um, despair? I mean, I hate the word hope because it's like, you know, I hope Santa Claus brings me, you know, a nice sled for Christmas kind of thing. It's a very passive the way it's often used, but still, I think this question of like um, thriving in this uncertainty is a really big, and important, and powerful question. You talked about it a little bit, but can you address that a little bit more? Yeah, um, um, obviously, you know, something I think about uh, and talk about a lot. Uh, you know, and there, I think there's a couple levels to the answer, but you know, the first on the sort of a, general psychological approach. I mean, where I am personally with this, with this process now is, is realizing that, you know, this is the life we've got and it, and we just talked about uncertainty and, and this era is, you know, is chock full of, of uncertainty, but it's also, um, you know, a slow moving change. And there, I just don't find a lot of, um, personally, you know, a lot of utility in, uh, you know, in despair, which kind of means, not doing anything or, you know, ceasing action or sort of a nihilistic view. I just, um, it's not a very purposeful existence. And so we live in the environment that we have, and this happens to be the uncertain and rapidly changing environment that we live in. And, you know, in the scale of geologic time, uh, you know, it's a sliver of a, of a moment. Um, uh, but another, you know, really optimistic point to me is, you know, that what we, um, you know, and we, I explore this in the book, but, you know, what we do right now makes a huge difference in the scale of change uh, that we're talking about. So there, you know, there is no binary, there's no black and white, you know, if, you know, we pass a certain date, then, then 50 million Americans will have to move as a result of climate migration or will suffer, you know, sea level rise. Um, I base a lot of the reporting in the book off of, or a lot of the ideas in the book off of um, global models of the changing human habitability niche. And, and it's this global study that suggests, you know, two to 3 billion people on the planet will slide outside of this, you know, climate niche and 160 million Americans will slide outside of this, this climate niche. Um, but that same research talks about what happens if we just cut emissions and we cut it fast and we still have a chance to do that. So, you know, this is the, you know, save the world from climate change speech, but, um, but it actually just makes a huge difference. And if we could, uh, you know, stick to one and a half degrees Celsius of warming, then that two to 3 billion, you know, person estimate drops by 50%, you know, the number of people that are not in, uh, zones of a planet that are too hot to live in, um, drops by, you know, three quarters, um, drops from 22% to 5% of people on the planet. Um, and so we can, cut our emissions and we can support policies uh, and politicians, you know, who try to do that. Um, and there's opportunity in that. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's opportunity and change in the United States too. Uh, you know, moving might be disruptive and the thought of being forced out of a place you love um, is certainly, um, you know, disruptive. Um, but, uh, but there's going to be plenty of growth and plenty of change that's, you know, that's positive positive. Uh, in, you know, in other parts of the country, um, will we, all parts of the United States, all parts of the world will obviously, you know, be affected, um, by climate change and, and face disasters and flooding and, you know, and, and, uh, uh, you know, more and more events like that. But according, you know, at least based on the primary threats that I analyze in the book, which I think are, you know, the biggest ones, um, you know, there's parts of the country that are relatively safe from those threats and, um, they're going to see, you know, uh, increases in crop yields and increases in economic opportunity and um, cities may be, you know, booming in the future in, in those parts of the world. And um, there, is, you know, there's plenty of fun to be had, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's a great way to end this. Uh, we got to wrap up. Um, thank you, Abram, for this. Congrats on the great book. Um, I hope everybody um, buys it, reads it, tells their friends about it. Um, it's really uh, an important book and um, I wish you all the best and thank you to New America for, for hosting this conversation.